In this video, we are going over five viral pandemics that changed human history forever, how they changed society, and how people of the time dealt with them. First on the list marked the beginning of the fall of the Roman Empire starting in 165 AD. I'm glad I didn't live during this time. It was called the Antonine Plague and was most likely a type of smallpox brought back by Roman soldiers returning from the Near East Siege of Seleucia during the height of Roman power. It killed over 5 million people, wiping out a third of the population in many areas. People from all classes of Roman society were afflicted and dying. The ill and dying caused manpower shortages, especially along the German frontiers, thus weakening the Romans' ability to defend the empire. Co-emperor Lucius Verus died from it at age 39. The efficiency and extent of their trade networks and roads helped spread the virus. The lack of available soldiers caused Marcus Aurelius to recruit any able-bodied man who could fight from gladiators, Germans, criminals, and free slaves. The patchwork army failed in its duty though. In 165 AD, Germanic tribes crossed the Rhine River for the first time in more than 200 years. The success of external attacks, especially by the Germans, facilitated the decline of the Roman military, which along with the economic disruptions, contributed ultimately to the decline and fall of the empire. The profound impact of the Antonine Plague deeply affected the identity of Romans and what it meant to be Roman. The death and capture of tens of thousands of Roman soldiers diminished the high status of being a Roman soldier. The military losses to German tribes undercut the notion of being a Roman citizen of the empire and meant that Romans were no longer safe, but vulnerable. Unlike adherence to the Roman polytheistic system, Christians believed in an obligation to assist others in a time of need, including illness. They were willing to provide the most basic needs, food and water, for those too ill to fend for themselves. This simple level of nursing care produced good feelings between Christians and their pagan neighbors, influenced the forming of the Byzantine Empire during the late antiquity and Middle Ages. One of the most notorious of Byzantine emperors was Justinian I. He extended the empire to its greatest limits, but at the cost of his people and infamously had the Justinian Plague named after him. The epidemic was the first outbreak of bubonic plague, the type transmitted through fleas on rats, most likely in port cities. The plague killed 25 to 50 million people over multiple outbreaks over two centuries and infected the ancient strategic city of Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire. Justinian was notoriously unmerciful to the population. He still demanded full annual tax, not only for yourself, but for your deceased neighbors as well. Over the next two centuries, there would be residual outbreaks with 5,000 deaths a day during its peak in Constantinople. Bodies stacked on the streets because there was no room to lay the dead. Justinian got the disease himself and survived. While most armies were retreating during the outbreak, Justinian tried to invade Persia, but failed. In his determination to recreate the former might of the Roman Empire, Justinian continued to wage wars in Italy and Carthage. Trade throughout the empire became disrupted. In particular, the agricultural sector was devastated. Less people meant fewer farmers who produced less grain causing prices to soar and tax revenues to decline. Inheritance suits overwhelmed the Byzantine system because so many people were dying without wills. People were desperate and resorted to superstitious rituals and magic. They often turned to home remedies that included magic amulets and rings, powders blessed by saints, cold water baths, and all types of alkaloids. Physicians at the time practiced the Greek system of medicine called humorism that was a blend of ancient alchemy and philosophy. They believed the body was made up of four vital liquids or humors that went out of balance caused illness. The treatments later evolved, granted not much better, during one of the most deadly pandemics of all time, the bubonic plague, also known as the Black Death because of the dark sores it left on the afflicted. The plague haunted Europe between the 14th and 17th centuries, killing between 75 and 200 million people, a 
around 30 to 60 percent of Europe's population. The death toll was so high that it had significant consequences on European medieval society as a whole. The shortage of farmers resulted in demands for an end to serfdom, a general questioning of authority and rebellions, and the entire abandonment of many towns and villages. People thought God was punishing them, so they repented their sins in the street, hoping the plague would be lifted. The most famous plague doctor of all time was the French oracle and astrologer, Nostradamus. He recommended clean water and air for patients and went against peers by saying bloodletting was not a good practice. Plague doctors relied on potions made of mercury, the practice of bloodletting, and dressing patients in garlic-soaked robes. Medieval doctors had no idea about such microscopic organisms as bacteria, and so they were helpless in terms of treatment. And where they might have had the best chance of helping people in prevention, they were hampered by the level of sanitation, which was horrible compared to modern standards. They thought the ancient miasma theory, or particles in the air that caused bad smell, spread the disease. People believed this until 1880, when germ theory of disease was discovered. Inside a plague doctor's mask were aromatics like juniper berry, mint, roses, cloves, and myrrh to purify the air they breathed in. Most were not experienced physicians or surgeons at all. Rather, they were often either second-rate doctors unable to otherwise run a successful medical practice or young physicians seeking to establish themselves in the industry. They rarely cured their patients. Instead, they served to record account of the number of people contaminated for demographic purposes. Quarantine of infected patients was the most effective measure in combating the spread. The term quarantine comes from where the bubonic plague first spread in Italy and the quarantining of all incoming sailors for 40 days. Shakespeare wrote King Lear while he was in quarantine. During the London plague, Newton was going to Cambridge and quarantined on his family's estate where the legendary apple tree was. He discovered the laws of gravity and motion, established modern optics, invented calculus, and revolutionized astronomy. This was intellectually most productive part of his life and started to form arguably one of the most important scientific books of all time, the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. It demonstrated as no prior work ever had that the universe was lawful, logical, and knowable. During the months of play that kept him at home imposed a mathematical order to the universe that permanently closed the door of the age of magic and opened the door to the incoming scientific revolution. Going on across the Atlantic Ocean was a new world epidemic that decimated the indigenous populations of the Americas, smallpox. The outbreak started in April 1520 when a Spanish ship arrived in Veracruz, Mexico. Two months later, Hernán Cortés and the Spaniards entered the Aztec capital, Chinochetlan, and by mid-October, the virus swept through the city, killing half the population. Smallpox killed the Aztec ruler, Quetlawic, and many of his senior advisors. The Western world by then could accurately date when astrological events were going to happen, and Cortés took this knowledge to make the Aztecs believe he was their reincarnated god, Quetzalcoatl. I'm not joking. The Aztecs took particular pride in their looks, and when the blistering boils erupted across their bodies, it forced a heavy psychological toll on them. All of this prompted Cortes to make an assault on the capital and take it over. Many old world diseases were brought to the new world. Indigenous people just did not have the same immune systems developed as the Europeans did. Old world diseases like smallpox killed 90% of the North American native population. Smallpox killed more of George Washington's army than the Revolutionary War. In 1796, the first vaccine was made for smallpox when Edward Jenner noticed milkmaids who previously caught cowpox did not catch smallpox. The last pandemic on the list and one of the most deadly was the Spanish flu that infected 500 million people. Calling it the Spanish flu, though, is a bit of a misnomer. Spain was neutral and had an open press, who during World War I still reported news without government censorship. Countries didn't want people or enemies to know they were fighting an epidemic and lower morale. 
the disturbingly deadly outbreak of influenza tore across the globe, infecting over a third of the world's population and ending the lives of 20 to 50 million people. With a mortality rate of 10 to 20 percent, there were 25 million deaths in the first 25 weeks alone. The flu spread so quickly because of the vast mobilization of armies during World War I. What separated the 1918 flu pandemic from other influenza outbreaks were the victims. Where influenza had previously only killed juveniles and the elderly or already weakened patients, it had begun striking down completely young, healthy adults, while leaving children and those with weaker immune systems still alive. No one is sure exactly how it started, but one theory is the outbreak may have started on a military base in France that reportedly had dirty conditions with sick birds and pigs. The flu mutated in the summer of 1918, initiating the deadly second wave. People started getting strange symptoms that confused doctors because the symptoms were not the same as when the flu started. Perfectly healthy people could die within 12 hours. Nurses and doctors came out of retirement to help treat all the ill. The Spanish flu killed more people than World War I. World War II. Korea. Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan wars combined. Society was pushed to the brink of collapse until the outbreak was contained in 1920. Looking back at these epidemics show how the fabric of society becomes tested and compelled to change in order to adapt to new circumstances. For me, all this begs the question of how we can change how we handle animals to prevent these zoonotic disease outbreaks. A good thing is that after every pandemic, scientists learn more about how to treat and minimize the spread of viruses. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe and hit the bell if you enjoyed this video.